Steve M. Thank you, Jeff. Steve Moore, alcoholic. Thank you, Steve. I too would like to welcome everybody to the primary purpose group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Glad you You got all the books we got in the group up here, don't you? Never mind, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I'm used to it, Jeff. Just not from you. Uh, so glad you're here. My job is to introduce the speaker. Uh, the group asked me to see if I could find one of the worst cases of alcoholism on the planet. And uh, Jonathan immediately came to mind. And, um, uh, but no, he's, he, he's, he's a good guy and uh, uh, really appreciate him coming down. Appreciate him bringing his bodyguard, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for getting him here safely. Uh, but I've known, known Jonathan several years. I, here's what I know about him. I'm sure he'll tell in his story that he's a solid member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He, he does have a heart of a servant. He serves his home group. He serves uh, uh, newcomers, and he serves Alcoholics Anonymous in a lot of different ways. But I'll, his job is to tell you the rest of it. So if you would, help me welcome Jonathan. How y'all doing? I'm Jonathan Smith, and I'm an alcoholic. It's a very wide room. Um, it's Friday date January 28, 2013. I have a home group, so there's a solution group in Holly Springs, North Carolina. We meet every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. We're actually meeting right now. Uh, and I have a sponsor, and also sponsor other men. So uh, I'm supposed to take in a general way uh, what I was like, what happened, what I'm like now, and how I established a relationship with with God, I'm gonna do my best. Um, you know, I, I come from uh, two very loving parents. You know, I don't come from a traumatic childhood. Um, I come from a hard-working blue-collar family. I'm I'm from about 20, 20 minutes east of Raleigh, a little town called Clayton, and uh, you know, I had everything I needed, most of what I wanted growing up. Um, but at a very early age, I experienced what I now know to be self-centeredness. You know, I experienced self-centered fear when I was in elementary school. You know. Um, I could walk into a, my classroom for the first day and feel like everybody in there had negative thoughts about me and everybody didn't like me or I was just always so insecure and like feeling like I had to prove myself and try to fit in, you know, and a lack of confidence is the best way to explain it. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I experienced that all the way to the moment I took my first drink, honestly, and I was 15 years old, you know. Um, my buddy came over to the house, he smuggled a Fruitopia bottle full of Crown Royal over the house, and I drank the whole the whole thing, you know. Um, just tipped it up, didn't stop. And, uh, you know, the, the effect, the book explains the, the powerful effect alcohol has on an alcoholic, you know. And I, I remember distinctly that I felt 10 foot tall and bulletproof. The confidence I was looking for my whole life was there. And I had a spiritual experience the first time I drank, you know. Um, I didn't start drinking alcoholically the very off off gate but I was a, I was a weekend warrior off gate I, I knew that I knew after that I wanted to drink every chance I got and I did um and I, I kind of got a story to go with that so like me being the lack of confidence and the self-centered guy that I was like girls and me didn't really get along at an early age you know I was scared to death of women loved them to death but I was scared to death of them you know <laughs> um and there was this girl in my neighborhood that she was about two years older than me, and she drove, and really, really pretty chick, and uh, she had no clue I felt the way I did about her, you know what I mean? Like, I would, she would she would drive through, and I'd be skateboarding, and I would, like, hide behind a tree and stare at her when she drove out there and would see me, you know? But when I, when I drank that bottle of liquor for the first time, I walked right to her house, knocked on the door, and had, like, an hour conversation with her. Made her laugh, made her... Made her giggle, made her, you know, never talked to her again after that. But I, my, my mind remembered that. You know, I, I remembered that time of drinking, but 10 years later, I couldn't remember all the tragic, horrible, and disgusting things that I did just a week before. But I would always remember that time that I went and talked to that girl and wasn't scared and wasn't. So, I mean, to me, that's alcoholism, you know. Um, so I, I took my first drink at 15, and I, I literally kind of had like a life shift after that, you know. Um, I, school wasn't important anymore. I stayed in I stayed in high school just long enough to turn 16 so I could drop out. Um, my parents did get divorced when I was 14. It has nothing to do with how I turned out. You know, honestly, even then I kind of knew it was for the best. Um, but at 16, I dropped out of school. My dad moved back to Raleigh, that's where he's from, and uh, my mom ended up moving back to Cary 
And I, I chose at 16 years old, 16, 17 years old, to stay sleep in my little pink Ford Escort that my parents bought me for 500 bucks with no hood. I chose to be homeless at 16 years old because I, I, like, I saw an opportunity to drink how I wanted to drink and I have any parental, parental advisory, you know. That's what I did, man. So, I mean, I was a 16, 17-year-old kid living in my car, couch surfing from friend to friend. I would break and enter into houses and steal hot dogs out of the refrigerator so I could eat. You know, looking back on it, I'm committing a felony. I probably just took some gold or something, but I didn't. Um, I was just hungry. And I, I did that for about a year. Um, you know, I just, and, you know, something happened. Like, I, my mom and my sister came and visited me one time. They found me, and I was about... I won't, but about 140 pounds healthy back then, and I was about probably 110 pounds. I mean, I was just disgustingly, just, I don't know. Like she, she said, my mom said something, and I saw the pain in her eyes. It kind of did something to me. I was like, maybe I should tighten up. This probably ain't normal, you know. Most of my friends are on their way to college. I'm over here sleeping in a pink car, you know. Um, so I moved back in with my mom. I decided to go get my GD, and, uh, you know, I, I ended up getting my GD. But there's a lot of kids like me that were in GD class. So, like, I started out with the best intentions in the world, you know, wanting to go, wanting to, go to college and get my GD. It was, like, the first step, and I ended up meeting people just like me, and we'd, we'd go to one ten minutes of the class and go outside and smoke a cigarette and end up at the outside issues house, you know. Um, <laughs> dr drugs are a huge part of my story, but every drug that I like to do allowed me to drink for a long day. That's what I was really after, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, ended up, it took me about two and a half years. I finally got my GED. Um, I was about 18 years old, and I <coughs> decided to go to college. Now, my, my thinking pattern, my thinking process of going to college was off, off, off gate because somebody told me. I, I remember picking up some information at an earlier time that nursing school had a lot of women, which is good, and had a lot of drugs and a lot of partying, which was also good. So I was like, I'm going to be a nurse, you know. And I went there, and they, they, everything that they said was was right, you know. Um, first semester, I had like a point zero two GPA. I didn't ever go to. I didn't ever go to class. Um, and the college I went to had a at Dale House, like right across the street. So I mean, it was perfect. I go to cigarette, have a cigarette, see the bar, want to drink, and go, and never go back to class. You know. Um, small little school. Ended up flunking out of the nursing part, doing the office part, and then flunking out of that, and then. Uh, just unmanageable, you know. Ended up doing massage therapy, realizing I want for me first like full body massage I ever did, and uh, <laughs> left that, you know. Um, yeah, I never equated drinking the problem. It was always like, eh, well, it's just you know, I made a, I made the wrong choice, you know. I, I wasn't seeing how drinking had anything to do with anything, you know. Um, and it, and for me, like, I had a lot of good times drinking, you know. It wasn't always bad. Like, I had a lot of good memories drinking. Like, towards then, no good memories, you know. But, I mean, alcohol was a powerful and effective solution for me for, for a long time. It's kind of like how I navigated through life, you know. So, uh, you know, I come from a long line of tradesmen. My dad's an electrician. My uncle was an electrician. I was always getting, I felt like I was always getting that kind of push down my throat growing up, and I rebelled against it and left school and ended up getting a job with my dad in electrical work. Um... You know, and I just didn't take it seriously, you know. Like, from, from that moment on, from about 18, 19 years old to when I got sober at 24, it was really blurry. It's very, that's when my alcoholism progressed, you know. I would, I could tell you for a fact that I wasn't a good member of society. I wasn't a good son. I wasn't a good employee. I wasn't a good brother. I wasn't a good father. I just, well, I was a nuisance to society. Um, I would take and I would take and I didn't care who got in the way. No, I won't, like... At 19, I, I had a kid, and I look, I, she came over to the hospital. I looked at her or something that got in the way of my drinking and abandoned her and left her. And that's something I <coughs> continue to make amends for to this day. But um, I just put some perspective how powerful alcohol is for me, you know. Um, so, yeah, I started doing that, you know. I started doing electric work, and I, it's, it's what I do today. I'll get to that later. Um, you know, I... I, just going to work was almost impossible for me, you know. Um, even before drinking age, you know, it was around 19 or 20 years old, I made a decision that I would, I couldn't drink liquor. Every time I drank liquor, I went to jail. And I was like, I, I, every, I, like, I can't even drink at home without neighbors calling cops on me and me going to jail, you know. <laughs> so, like, 
before drinking age, before legal drinking age, I, I already am trying to man. Like the book says I'm trying to manage my alcoholism, I'm trying to manage the outcome of me drinking. You know, um, so I, I'd, I'd go to work sometimes. You know, like my dad worked there, so like I could, I could. Like, they called me part time back then because I'd only work like 30, 32 hours a week. <laughs> I'd never be. I would get paid Thursday, so it was. If you were a betting man, you could bet bet that I wouldn't be there on Friday. You know, and um, I did that for like six months, and I'd quit and. Go cook somewhere and then go back. I went back twice. Uh, at 19, I I got my first DUI. Um, it was literally, I, I slammed two Bud Light limes and drove home. It was like it was like I was at a buddy's house, like three miles away from where I lived. I didn't really see much wrong with it. The, my friends took me drinking after I got out of jail. You know, it was literally like any any anybody that I looked up to back then had at least one DUI. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't uncommon that people had DUIs. You know. And I um, yeah, went through that, lost my license for a year. Um, went back to went back to the electrical company for the second time, and uh, I was working. And you know, I started getting getting involved with people that were a distribution specialists. You know, um, <laughs> they would. Uh, I was about I was about twenty twenty one twenty two years old, and. Uh, you know, we, their their house. We called it the crack house. But there's no crack there. I don't know, to this day. I don't know why everybody called it the crack house. But I was I was over there hanging out and I, you know, doing what we did and drinking and um, had didn't drive. I uh, I just remember waking up one morning and being like, you know, at this point I'm not I'm not just drinking on the weekends. You know, it's starting to slip into like like at first it'd be like every other Friday I drink whenever I could get it. And then it'd be like, definitely every Friday I'm going to drink. And then every Friday and Saturday. And then every Friday, Saturday, Sunday I'm real hungover, so I'm going to drink a little bit on Sunday. And at this point I'm starting to drink throughout the week, you know, like on a consistent basis. Like I, I no longer have the power to not to just drink on the weekends, you know. And I, I just woke up one morning and I, now I know that it was, it, was, it was God talking to me, telling me that there was something, something serious was about to happen. I just had this... this very unshakable sense of impending doom. Like, I don't know how to explain it, man. Like, I guess if y'all have ever experienced that before, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I just couldn't shake it, you know. I, I tried to shake it, and I tried to just go about my day, but later on that night, I just, I wanted, like, no, there was no alcohol in the park. <coughs> I was like, man, I got a drink, dude. Like, you're, somebody's going to either, somebody's going to get me right to the store right a second, or I'm going to steal one of y'all's car and go to the store and get a 40 ounce, man, because I, I got a drink, you know, and then talked to a friend of mine and let me borrow his, uh, borrow his car and, Long story short, it, this this is the only time I'll say alcohol saved me from some heartache. Because when I went to the store about five minutes away, man, I, I went to the store, got the beer, and was coming back, and the whole is like dusk, and then the whole tree line is colored up blue, flashing blue from all the blue lights, man. The, these distribution specialists I was telling you about were selling like two undercover cops for a year. And they had my name, all their names, and like I, just because I wanted a beer so bad. I won't there that like seconds there was, there was like a small window to where you know and I had a lot of fear about it. I was like they think I snitched on them man like, they're like they're, they're gonna come after me you know and uh but even then it's like I, I didn't really I, I saw it I was like that was a close call I think moving to Vermont is what I'm gonna do you know <laughs> moving to Vermont is a solution stop doing drugs and I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Vermont and I I just thought that I was like, I need new friends man like my friends are just the problem you know um <laughs> And I did that, you know, my, my mom had a boy, they're married now, it's my stepdad, but my mom had a boyfriend that was from Vermont, and he made pretty good money, and he had some connections up there doing framing and sheetrock work, and uh, he told me if I ever want a job, I knew he was up there, he goes up there every six months and comes back, and I called him, he was like, yeah, come on up here, you know, and they pay up there, it's pretty good, and I was, I tell you now, that like, I, I moved to Vermont, and I never did a drug since then, I, 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 I was able to put drugs down. I was able to, it ain't, I was like, because I, I knew that alcohol, like I knew that I had alcohol, it's good, you know. Um, and I can tell you now that there ain't nothing to do but drink in Vermont. <laughs> Probably a lot more to do, but I was out of my element, man. Like I'm from Johnston County slash Raleigh, North Carolina, and I moved to Essex, Vermont, like 20 miles south of the Canadian border. It was cold, it was really cold, and it was very green or white, depending on what time of year it was, and uh. And they have very strong beers up there, like IPAs everywhere, you know. And uh, 
you know, before then, I would always, I wouldn't let myself drink before noon. I don't, I don't know where this idea came from. I was like, only alcoholics and people that have drinking problems drink before noon. So I, I would literally wait until 12 o'clock on the dot and I'd start drinking. Like, we're good. That was, that was normal to me, you know. Well, up there, man, I didn't have it. Like, again, I didn't have anybody to, anybody to answer to. I was making good money and, um, I was drinking a lot, you know. Um, I'd wake up at, you know, I'd be up at like five in the morning to go to work, and I, my my stepdad's boss let me rent it. He, he would let me, he let me rent the little apartment above the garage, and um, I mean it was just bad. It was, that six months was just really bad. My alcohol, I could tell you then that at 22 years old I was a full blown alcoholic. There was no, I didn't have any power of choice over drinking at that point. You know, like I that's when I I could tell you for the first time I remember swearing off alcohol forever. And meaning it, man, and within two hours drinking. Mm-hmm. Somehow I'd done taught myself into it'll be different this time, you know. And uh, I, you know, I get up at six in the morning, and um, by nine I was drinking. By two o'clock I was trying to sleep with my boss's wife. By six o'clock I was falling down drunk, <laughs> down the steps, you know. Um, and that was a bit, and that that continued for for six months, you know. Um, I was just not that. I, I showed that family a side of humanity that they probably never want to see again, you know. And like I said, like they kindly asked me to leave after six months. Um, you know, they, they had two small boys. I'd be so drunk, I'd try to go. They'd want a bathroom, so I had to walk through there, like go to their inside their house, go to the bathroom. And I got to the point where I, I mean, I would just being drunk, I wouldn't want to go in there and disturb them and stumble through their house and piss them off or whatever. And uh, I'd go outside, and it was like negative seven to go to the bathroom and lock myself out in my underwear, you know, like just bad things were happening, you know. Um, and the, the final straw of it was, uh, the fun, I, like this, I like this little rod thing. The, the final straw of my stay up there was um, they, had, they had two eight-year-old kids that, you know, back then, it was back about ten years ago, ten, eight, ten years ago, something like that. And this YouTube live stuff was just getting like big, and I had cell phones and all that stuff, you know. And uh, my my room was just littered with beer cans everywhere. And they they sell thirty packs of beer up there, so I'd I'd get two thirty packs every time I went to the store, and I I, I didn't want it. So instead of locking myself out, I, I learned if I pee in these beer cans, I can just keep peeing. Yeah, you know what I mean. It made sense to me. I'm I'm a very uh, survivalist, you know. I can get through, but uh. I had these Miller Lite cans everywhere, man, full of just pee. And I would take them out. When I got tired of them, I'd finally clean up and I'd take them out or whatever, and I would just go pour them out in the snow and throw them away. And uh, well, they went up there with their little YouTube thing, and they, they think that it was cool to be drinking on the YouTube live thing or whatever, eight years old. So they grabbed a can of my pee and drank it and put it on there. And I guess, and I, you know, they yelled at me. His parents got mad at me. I was more concerned at why these eight-year-olds wanted to drink beer. But it's none of my business, you know. I got a mouthful of my pee, and I, that was it. Um, I came back here, and, uh, you know, the, the big book, talk, there's a part where it talks about you, somebody might burn a mattress, you know, all the things we did. Like, I never burned a mattress, but when I got back, I was so just irritable, restless, and discontented. Like, I, I knew that me not, me losing that opportunity in Vermont was a direct result of my drinking. Like, I, I knew that, you know. Um, but it didn't matter. Like I, I still drank. I didn't have a choice. I was going to drink, you know. And um, but I was I was starting to get real irritable and frustrated, discontented. Like if I didn't get what I wanted, then you'd know it, you know. And if I wasn't able to drink how I wanted, you'd know it. And I ripped the. I moved back in with my mom. She for some reason I don't know to this day why she moved to Andrew. She was living in Andrew, and uh, yeah, I don't probably know what Andrew is, but ain't much much to it. Um, it was really bored, man, and like it won't like. Even in Vermont, I had more access to alcohol. I didn't have a car. I wasn't driving. I was living in Andrew. It was like a twenty-minute horse ride to the closest <laughs> store. You know, it was like it was just it was frustrating living there. So I, I, I was like, I'm just gonna quit drinking, man. Like I'm, I'm just gonna quit. And I lasted about two days of trying to quit drinking. I say quitting. Like I was taking Clonopin, so I wouldn't take the edge off of it. So I wasn't really quitting, and I still was just like a pinned up ball man like I was just ready to snap you know and I uh, I just remember I remember getting real irritated ripping the countertop island on my mom's kitchen and going and drinking and uh 
and I, I, I the, the book talks about it, you know you can quit drinking and it's a progressive illness you know and in those two days man I drink I wouldn't got a I knew that Milwaukee's best ice to do the trick you know I got a case of that stuff and I couldn't drink it fast enough man um you know towards the end of my drinking I was I'd literally have a beer and two it feel like two gulps would be gone you know um it was, it was, you know, you know, it's pretty disturbing when your own drinking speed disturbs you. And I'm like, ah, just, just got it. Let me get another one, you know. Um, that's just the way it was, you know. I, uh, let's see, Andrew, um, drinking was no longer fun, you know. Like, the best way for me to explain this, like, at the beginning, drinking was, it was fun, fun, fun. Okay, I did something stupid, and it was fun, fun, good time, good time. It was like fun, fun, bad, 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 fun, and and then it was just straight bad all the time. But I always, I would always remember the good times, you know. I'd always remember the effect it had on me at first, man. How it literally lifted me up out of the self pity and like nerdy little boy that I was, scared to talk to anybody. And it gave me an identity, you know. I always remember that, man. I always went through it. And that peculiar mental twist is what I always went to whenever I'd talk myself into drinking again, you know. I mean, that uh, that's scary. Being recovered from that state of mind, knowing that I lived there for a long time, that that alcoholism literally, like you, we, ha I have a brain that wants to kill me. The way I think wants to kill me, and it'll always tell me that it'll be different this time. That's just that ain't insidious, and that ain't the enemy. I don't know what it is, you know. Um, and that's kind of that from from Andrew on to the my sobriety day. That's the best way to explain it. Is I wasn't a, I wasn't a. Um, child of light anymore. I was playing for the other team, you know. I started doing things I wasn't very proud of. I would meet up with ex-girlfriends and create some, do, commit some very, very, very bad offenses with them. I would black out really fast, do things I didn't know I did, would wake up in jail. Um, long story short, and from November to January 28, 2013, I had three charges. I had assault on a pit bull. I got in a fight with a pit bull drinking moonshine one night. Uh, I slammed my one of my best friends in the hood of a car and caused like $2,000 of damage at a bar. Still banned from that bar to this day, which is cool. I don't care to go back anyway. But um, I got my second DUI, you know. And my second DUI, like I was... And the police report said I was speaking in tongue. I was... My, like... like just... I mean, it, I, don't, I don't even remember. Like, it, I, I remember getting out of jail and getting home, and my attorney sending me the police report, and literally not believing what they said. I was like, they are, there's a conspiracy against me, man. I did not do none of this stuff. They like said that I was slamming my head into the side of the cop car, calling the cop all sorts of names. Um, now, I do kind of remember when I got pulled over, I remember him, I've been, been riding four-wheelers and drinking beer all day long, and then I ended up finding out there's this, like, $4 bottle of wine at the gas station called Mad Dragon. It's like 22% alcohol. Man, if you want to get lifted, that stuff, dude, would just take you there fast. And uh, I had a I had an open bottle of that Mad Dragon in my lap, and I had a I had an open beer can. And I remember the cop asking me if I had been drinking, and I was like, uh. -uh. He, didn't, he, didn't give me, he didn't give me breathalyzer. He just told me to get out, and they arrested me. And I can tell you, four hours after I got out, after I was in the holding cell, I remember getting breathalyzer, and I blew like a point two eight. Four hours after I was, I don't even want to know what al what level I was at driving. Somebody called Star HP on me when I was on Interstate 40 and told me that I was swerving. I, and the cop said that I, there's three reports that almost ran them off the road. And just by the grace of God, I'm standing there not not in prison. You know, I mean, I could have, I, I could not. When I was driving, the period I had my license, I had a car, I, I could not not drink and drive. It was just very neurotic in that way, man. Like if I wanted to go, I would go and put a lot of people and myself in, in danger that way. Um, I'm just very grateful I didn't kill somebody because it could easily happen. And I, you know, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Like I, when I first started doing correction work and going into central prison, I, the first person I met was there for two counts of vehicle manslaughter, and he told me what happened. And I was like, man, I, that's all. That that'll just open your eyes, you know. Um, but uh, I got my second DUI, and it wasn't as fun. You know, I didn't have friends at this point to take me out drinking when I got out. Uh, I, did not, I was disgusted with myself, you know, and I did not want to drink anymore. And my mom was trying to, I was still living with my mom, you know, it was a common threat. I'm a mom's boy, I guess. But uh, my mom was trying to help this 
homeless woman named Rose out, really sweet woman, real bad drinker, man. She used to live behind the Winn-Dixie and Andrew, and she was trying to help her out. And uh, Rose, this homeless woman, told me she couldn't drink me anymore. That was an eye-opener, man. I was like, what do you mean, Rose? Like, go back to your tent if you want to drink. You know what I mean? Like, it ain't that bad, man. But uh, that happened around there. That was that was just demoralizing, you know. That tent City Rose didn't want to drink with me no more. But, you know, she helped me that night. It, that made me look at myself, man. Like, a lot of things happened that DUI made me look inward. Um, and it was around that time that I conceded to myself. I remember I remember distinctly, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. I'd been up drinking all night, and I was all in pity party mode, listening to Old Crow Medicine Show on the porch, mm-hmm. watching kids go to the bus stop, drinking. And I remember telling myself, I'm an alcoholic. And once that happened, it was like, pfft, every time I drink, just... I mean, it just felt like it's a complete separation of the spirit, you know. Like I was at that point, I was like, "This is my life. I gotta learn how to manage it. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die trying," you know. And that's what that's what happened. I I got a DUI. I went. To, I, I I did think that it's important for me to for me to say this that I had this real big delusion, man, towards in my drinking that if I just found a good woman and had her <laughs> stuff together. She would fix me. I would have a reason, you know. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of, you know, doing this to myself. I just need a real good woman. And, you know, my God really understands me. And he gave me that, man. He gave me it. There was, she was a nurse at a hospital. She had her own car. She had her own house. Um, pretty. She was real pretty, you know. And uh, I, she was, like, she liked me for whatever reason, man. And we started to be in a relationship, you know. And she told me after, like, the second week, like, Jonathan, tell you now that you sober no complaints but like periods that you're not drinking no complaints at all but the minute you drink you turn into somebody i have no desire to be with and i just like so you're either it's either that or and she was like i'm not saying we don't drink let's just go out friday night and drink or whatever and i was like and i wanted to do that man i was like yeah yeah dude let's do it you know she was like just have one or two beers with me and we'll go dance or whatever and it'll be fine you know i wanted without a shadow of a doubt to do that and i set out to do that this is like on a Wednesday, thank God. If it was like a Monday, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But um, I, uh, we went out Friday night, and the first thing I noticed was dollar jello shots on the sign. It's the first thing I noticed. So I'm like, cha-ching, you know, I'm going to sneak around and I'm going to get some of that. But uh, I went and had the one Bud Light or whatever, and she ran into somebody she knew, and I snuck off the other side of the bar and ordered 10 of those jet. I wanted one for each finger, you know. I was like, here's a $10 bill, man. And I'll never forget I mean, she was real short. She was like this tall, man. And I'm standing like this, looking like a dummy over there. And I'm like doing the jello shots. And somebody taps me on the shoulder. I turn around. I've got the jello shots right here. And she just looked at me disgusted, man. Like, completely disgusted. I, I didn't know. I didn't have anything to say to her, you know. Um, so, well. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so that, that didn't work, you know. That relationship didn't work. Um, and it was, it was around that time that she was talking to a guy. I didn't really like her talking to this guy. I considered him a threat, I guess. And I, that's where... To, I don't know how my friend, the, guy, like the one guy that, I, that came with me that night, ended up being the one that got slammed on the car. Because I know I went out there after him. And I, but I was in a blackout, man. And uh, I think he maybe he got in between us or something, and I just got mad. And I was in a blackout, so that's what happens. Um, we're still friends, you know. It's okay, he forgave me. But... uh. I had that. I went to jail that night um, for that, and then that my last like January twenty seventh. I, I just remember it being a Sunday, you know. And, and I love the way the book explains the many different ways we controlled our drinking. I'm not gonna read it to y'all, but there, like, there's like beer only, only drinking on weekends, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job, like all these things. I I checked. I I did all those things, man. Like in the last year of my my drinking, I did all those things. Like I was just telling this kind woman over here before that. uh I had, to ex- I had to exhaust every single avenue that I had to try to either quit drinking or control my drinking before I'd come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I almost went one time when I was like 21, but ended up at a gas station drinking instead. Um, you know, I, I just had this delusion and this thing that I was too young to be an alcoholic, and all alcoholics did was just talk about how they used to drink, and that sounds terrible. So I at least want to be able to drink. So I, that that almost killed me, that mindset and that ego, and that, that just – Complete closed off to anything new, almost killed me, man. And uh, toward like the last, the last part of my drinking, I, I was on this whole. I, if I don't leave my house 
and if I don't drink liquor, and if I only drink Friday and Saturday nights, nothing bad can happen. How can anything bad happen? My last drunk was on a fifth of moonshine, walking down the street on a Sunday. So, I mean, I had no power over it. Dude. Like, I, and I remember that man. Like, I just remember, I just remember being all sad because the girl left me, and all boo hoo hoo. And uh, I remember that I had a bottle of some Percy Flowers moonshine in the freezer to make me feel pretty good. And you know, I was like, I'm just gonna have one drink. I'm just gonna go home and I'm gonna have one little mixed drink. And it was just, just abnormally uncomfortable on the skin that day. You know, like I was itching to come out of my skin. You know. And I went and made me a drink, and put on Leonard Skinner, and started playing darts at 8.30, you know, in the morning on Sunday. And uh, started shooting darts, and before you know what, I'm in the freezer tipping the bottle. I drank that drink already, and my next memory is me tipping the bottle. And I remember looking at it, going down, like, I really just wanted to have one drink. And here I am again, drinking this bottle, tipping it now, straight to the, straight, straight to the head. I thought, well, I'm here now, I might as well just you know, keep doing it. And at this point, my dad, you know, I'm about... I come from a, I can't say I come from, I have a lot of people in my family that, that drink heavy, you know, and they drink, they drink like I do, but they all are able to stop when they want to, you know, and that's the difference between me and them, so I couldn't stop, so I tried, man, I had no power, dude, alcohol was my master, you know, and my dad came home, and I guess he was in the mood, and he helped me finish that bottle off, and before you know it, we're both, we're both charged with assault on the pit bull, um, <laughs> it's like Beverly Hillbillies, man, you know, like, <laughs> We were down the road, during, my dad got hit in the head with a chair. He was in an ambulance. Um, it was just crazy, man. We both locked ourselves out of the apartment, so we kicked down the door of the apartment, you know, because we were locked out. The whole door frame's gone. I, and it was that night that, oh, no, it was about two weeks before that. I, this is important. It's just that demoralization, you know. Like, I, this woman and her kid came out, and I, I'm so drunk, I can't even open the door. I'm leaning on the door, like, just. God, I gotta sober up enough where I can open the door. So every time I tried to stand up to open the door, I'd fall down. And um, she came outside, and she had a little, her little son, and she shooed her son on the other side of her, and gave me this look and walked like I was just a piece of trash, you know. And I was like, man, I'm not gonna. I come from a good home, you know. Like, yeah, my dad's a heavy drinker sometimes, but he taught me the difference between right and wrong, you know. And I have a family that loves me and wants what's best for me, and I. Come from good roots, and this is what I become. And I, I said a prayer. This is two weeks before that whole pit bull night. And I said, "God, help me, quit drinking. Like, just help me." And I believe with, at that moment, loving and powerful Creator entered into my heart and my life. And two weeks later, I was on the way to treatment. You know, that's what my surrender looked like. It was on January 27th. After that, I was like, "No matter what I do, I can't. I, I got no charge. You know what I mean? No matter what I do, I can't. I can't not go to jail or do something that resembles jail. I can't get a, not get a court date." Every time I drink bad things happen, I hate myself. I can't. And every time I think about not drinking ever again, it sounds terrible and depressing and it's just miserable. And then when I think about drinking, that's miserable too. So I just can't keep doing this, man. And like I was there for about a year, you know. And, uh, and I, you know, I, my, my moment of clarity, my surrender looked like that. You know, I just, I gave up. I was like, I cannot not drink. And I cannot quit on my own. I've tried everything. I've tried literally everything that I can do. Every different, I think uh, Dr. Bob talks about the beer experiment. I was on a beer experiment my whole adult life drinking, you know. Um, I thought liquor was the problem, but when you drink 30-something beers, the same thing happens, you know. Like the, just the lack of control, man. And, I, you know, I, I wanted to go to this co-ed place in Harnett County and ended up at a men's treatment center in Raleigh called the Healing Place. It's a long-term treatment center, and I... I can tell you now that I, you know, my mom's always been there for me. She's like the one solid rock, loves me to death. Firstborn son, you know, like my mom, you know, her tight, and I cussed her slam out the whole way to treatment center because she wouldn't stop and give me a beer. Like, made her cry, you know. Um, I said, I'm quitting forever, mom. I get one more beer, you know. She wouldn't do it. Thank God, man. She wouldn't do it. And uh, I got to healing place. There's a guy there, and I call him Indian Larry. His name's Larry. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, he uh, he looked at me and he said I was I was fighting because they wanted me to not have a cell phone. I'm like, it's 2013. Everybody's got a phone, man. Like, I don't know if I can give up my phone, you know, All right? Because I needed it that much. And nobody called me, you know. Um, but I uh, he was like, he looked at me. He was like, Jonathan, you're not alone, and you never have to drink again. And those two things just completely floored every bit of every bit of defense that I was trying to every bit of. Whatever it was trying to keep me from going to that place, just smashed it right there. And then my mom, like, like the, the final nail in the coffin was my mom 
broke down crying. And my sister, who never cries, she's tough, man. You know what I mean? She takes after dad's side of the family. And my sister don't ever show emotion. And she broke down crying. And my mom told Larry that alcoholism's taking my son from me. And it just hit me right between the eyes, man. And I gave him my phone and I went into detox, man. Um, I was 24 years old. The next day I met with the doctor. The doctor told me that my liver was enlarged. Um, the whites of my eyes were yellow. I was about 220 pounds. It just bloated. Must be, is that cricket? Oh. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, I was about 220 pounds of just beer weight, you know. Uh, he told me if I could, if I drink how I did, I wouldn't have lived to see 30. And I just turned 31 this past year, so it's pretty cool. Um, but I was just broken, man. Like, you know, the, the principle was on the first three steps. I, when I woke up in detox, I never prayed. It's, and, it, like, I, I can't even say I prayed for a long time, but I woke up in the morning, and after, you know, I drank a half of a half a gallon of moonshine. So I, first I thought I was in jail. I was like, what jail do people wear scrubs in? I laid there for 10 minutes looking around trying to figure out where I was at, you know. And once it started, once the memories of the night before and everything that happened in my life, man, started to come, like, I, I, I said a prayer that I never meant, just meant it more than two weeks before. I like, I don't care where I go, God, I just don't want to go back to where I just came from. Um, and that's been my experience, man. Like, I've been lifted. There is a power in Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps that will help you if you seek it. And I, I can tell you that, I can tell you with, with that, without any doubts that, if you're as desperate as I was when I first got here to change and you take this, do what's in the book, man, be, God is good. Um, the desire for, to drink for me was, was lifted in detox. I never had an obsession to drink after that. And, you know, when I think about the obsession today and when I tell people that, like, I, I was, I'd be at work thinking about how I was going to drink mm-hmm. before break time. My co-worker's Bill Jonathan, it's not even 9 o'clock in the morning yet, talking about drinking. I'm like, whatever, man. Mm-hmm. I'll talk about it no more, you know, but I would still be thinking about it and planning. As soon as I got off, go get a beer, you know, for a ride home. Um, and that was lifted. I never obsessed about drinking again after I said that prayer in detox. And I, you know, all the old the old ideas and delusions that I had about um, drinking were smashed, man. Like I met a lot of people younger than me that drank like me and that were 60, 90 days sober, and they were offering me cigarettes for nothing in return. You know, like normally if you gave me something or nice to me, either one of what I had, or you wanted my woman. But yeah, you never did like where I'm from you just don't do nice things. And I guess that's just because I never really had true friends before, you know. Um but I I there I, I was identified with people early on, you know, like people would they didn't come up to me and tell me about what I need to do, which what everybody else did before. Like they would tell me what they did. Like I used to be like this, this is what I used to do and this is what I've done, this is where I'm at now and I'm glad you're here. And you know, like the process of identification happened for me to where I identify with them, saw the light that they had and wanted it. And like I I literally just did what I was told. Like I had a I, and I, I got a, I got a sponsor. It took me about thirty days um of being there. But you know, this treatment center like we had to we had to go to three speaker meetings a week and that's where I spiritually identified with another human being who stood up there and told my story. He put it into words for the first time. That's why I love speaker meetings, man, like 'cause I mean that's just I'll never forget that dude. Like he he uh he told my story. He put words on things that I couldn't put words on my entire life. And I knew that he got it. And I knew that I was in the right place. You know? And then I got a sponsor. And my first time meeting my sponsor, he told me that he was going to read this book to me from the beginning to the end. We were going to do what I said to do, write where I said to write. And he said it, won't, it should take about six months to go through the whole book, meeting once a week. We made a time to commit to meeting, and he was there. That blew me away, man. He showed up every, even five months later, every Saturday at 7 o'clock. I knew he'd come pick me up, and we'd go get coffee, and we'd read. And there's little things like that that happened. That, were the, that was the power at first, you know. Um, and he told me that the only reason he did this because I, I was expected to do it. And then I was expected to do the same thing, to be willing to carry this message to a sick and suffering alcoholic. And he explained to me that I didn't have to figure it out. God was going to provide that for me. To just never say no and always be willing. And that's literally what I, I, I... I'd love to be able to stand up here and tell you all these game-changing things that I did, but I'm not... I don't change anything. I just did what the people before me did. You know, I believe that the path was the path was trudged before I got here, so I don't need to divert from it. I don't need, again. It's worked pretty well for me. Um, you know, my, my first we went through the first. Like I said, the first I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew I, was, I knew I didn't have any power over drinking. I knew that my life sucked. I knew that 
I, I could not make my life better, and I couldn't quit drinking. And um, I knew that I knew that I had a allergy. I learned. I didn't know it before, but I learned that I didn't have any control of drinks. I was allergic <coughs> to alcohol. You know that when I drink, I had no control over amount I take in. I have an abnormal effect to it. My body processes alcohol different. And I have a mind that will always bring me back to it. It's kind of like a double-edged sword, you know. I'm screwed if I do, and I'm screwed if I don't. And that I learned that the, the effect of alcohol has a power. Like I, I just learned I want unique here, you know. Um, you know, the, my, my main problem was the second step. That's what kept me out there, man. I thought that I could quit this. I quit smoking cigarettes one time for about three months. I was like, when I want to quit drinking, I can quit drinking. Like I said, it almost killed me, man. Like, I, I wanted to quit for a long time, and it just got worse and worse and worse. So I, I believe that I believe that I, I believe that if I did my, my sponsor broke it down beautifully, man. I mean, he told me that you don't have to know what God is now. He was like, if you just believe that if you do what I did, you'll have the same results. That's enough. And I believe that if I did what these people in AA did, then I would have the same results. And I was willing to believe that. And we moved on. And I remember going to Saying this third, saying a third step prayer in the middle of the busiest church parking lot of Wake County. I mean, there was hundreds of people around me, and it was the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. Getting on my knees with a man saying a third step prayer, but I did it. I didn't have some burning bush experience after that, you know. But I, I, I meant it, you know. I, I gave my life to God that day, and He was like, and I thought that I'd get a little break, you know. The only way about the treatment center, He was like, start writing, man. Like, when, as soon as we part, we kept reading after the third step. <laughs> He like he taught me about the four step. Told me how to do it. He said, right, resentments, fears, conduct, and uh, I did that. You know, um, I, the the first thing that I learned, the only thing I can remember from my first four step, the pattern that I recognized on my own was that I made decisions based out of fear my entire life that either directly or indirectly affected me. And it took a fifth step for me to see that that fear came from extreme self centeredness. I didn't like to be affected. I wanted to fit in. I was always consumed with myself. I was always about how I felt. Me, me, me. My earliest memories, I've been like that, you know. And that's where like, I learned how to, it's like my, my survival was based on decisions out of fear. Like I would try to place myself to either be accepted or be liked or whatever, you know. It's extreme self-centeredness. Um, and I could tell you, you know, we did five, six, and seven right there, and then I had a good knowledge about myself and I wanted to change and I can tell you that from that day I've never cheated on a girlfriend I've never stole from a gas station I've never willingly I can't say I've ever willingly I've still played hooky at work a couple times since Friday but um a lot of uh a lot of my defects were removed at that day like I I, I, got, I believe that God removed them like straight up and uh, all the other stuff that I had, like, I try to practice on a daily basis, man. It's like Paul's been agitated and doubtful. And to take different actions, you know. Like, I like to control things, man. Like, something I deal with six years later, I still, I like to control things. But I'm not, I'm not as bad about doing it out loud now, but in my head, I still like to control things. And I can get in a real squirrely place, man, being like that. But now it's like, I try to recognize it, say a prayer. If it gets real crazy, man, depending, it's always with my girlfriend, or it gets really bad, you know. Um... But I will try to say a prayer, call my sponsor, and be like, hey, this is going on. And most of the time, I can all, he'll always take me back to where we gave up the right to control our life and others in the third step. It's always, always there, you know. But stuff like that, man, like, i got to make a conscious decision to take different actions on, you know. Um, I'll tell you this, like, I, I, I work for, time flies, by. I, uh, I'm going to tell you about two amends that I made, you know. After we did that, I thought I was to get another break, you know, and I didn't. Um, oh, at this point, I had a strong desire to help other people, and uh, my sponsor had to make five amends. We kept reading, we read through steps ten, eleven, and twelve, and that's where I try to live today. But I, uh, I made amends my mom, my sister, my dad, all the easy ones, and um, made amends to court. You know, God showed up for me in court, man. Like all those charges that I had, I was, my, my attorney told me to suit up for doing two years in prison because the way that I treated the cop and the DA was seeking maximum sentence. I ended up doing four weekends in jail when I got a treatment. God is good. Um, I uh, the other charges the DA magically lost the paperwork, so one of the charges was dropped. That's all God, man, and that's a direct result of me working the steps. I was there, fully prepared to admit my wrongs and take my punishment. You know, um, one of the girls I tell you I did some real felonious things to. 
ended up dying in a drinking and driving accident, and I wrote her an honest letter. And that's what I was told to do. I carried that with me for a long time. And two days after, she died three years before I got sober. Two years after, or two days after I wrote that letter, my mom called me and told me that she was like, hey, Colleen, which is Kelsey's mom, found a letter Kelsey wrote to you about 10 years ago apologizing to you for something. Do you want it? So through the power of the amends and the power of the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I amended something with a deceased ex-girlfriend. At that moment, I was sold on God. Like, I was pretty much sold before then. But at that moment, I remember being like, there is a God. And I haven't looked back since. I, I made a decision to serve Him at that moment wholeheartedly, you know. Um, so I, I work for Star Electric now. You know, I went from a, I went from a guy who, I, long story short, when I was still drinking, I, I wanted to leave work early one day. I need a good excuse to tell my dad, so I pretended like I hurt my finger on a spool of wire. That ended up becoming like a $10,000 workman's comp claim, and I claimed the money just because I wanted to go home early. But uh, that lie just progressed and progressed, and I ended up getting paid for it. And back then, I was like, yeah, dude, yeah, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me, you know? But uh, I ended up having to make that right, and I got my job back there about three years sober. And I was like, I'm just going you know, to I'm get, get in the door good with him, Jerry. And I'm gonna, I told my sponsor, I'm just going to get in the door good with him, and I'm going to... He was like, no, you're going to make that amends now. <laughs> you're not going to wait to make it. You're going to make that amends now. And I was scared to death, man, and I did it. And my boss told me this conversation never leaves the truck. Get back to work. And I went from that employee did that to being a state champion apprentice. I won this. They, they, the company's invested money into me. They just sent me to California to compete in national competition. And, I, and this is just from doing what I was taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, admitting where I'm wrong, showing up to work every day, Doing what they pay me to do—it's really not hard. I don't know why it was so difficult for me before, man. Like I, they just—they pay me to do a job, and I just try to do my job. I don't try to get into the politics of anything. I don't try to save people while I'm there. You know, like I've had the opportunity to help people that I work with, but a lot of times people, non-alcoholic people at work, help me. You know, um, I don't know. Like I just—I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous and. And if, if you're new in here and you doubt that this will work, I doubted that it would work, it would work too. I, I doubted that everything I tried to do to control and quit drinking never worked, so I assumed this would work. And I can tell you it's the farthest from the truth, that there's a power, a loving and powerful God that I found through the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that will help you if you seek Thank you.